Hey guys, I'm Jeff and uh, welcome to my shop. I'm really excited to share this with you. Uh, many of you have probably heard of, and if you haven't, there's a project being put on by the YouTube channel NYC CNC Johnny5. Their machine shop, Saunders Machine Works, is building a full functioning, uh, full scale robot from the movie Short Circuit and Short Circuit 2. And it's been something they've been doing for about a year now, maybe a little bit more. They're, they're building all of it. They were building all of it in-house on all of their CNC machines, everything from small Tormox up to their huge Haas 5-axis machines. It's been really cool just to watch that project. Not too long ago, they actually opened the project up to a lot of other machine shops and creators. After bribing them with several hundred gift baskets, uh, they were actually they were actually really cool about sending me a part to do so that I too could contribute with the Johnny Five project, which I'm super stoked to have that opportunity. This little guy. Okay, so it's it's not a super large or complex part, uh, but it's really cool to have done this. It actually did have a few uh, little things that were challenges um, on a little home-built machine like mine. We had a bearing pocket that we needed to hit right on, and uh, there was a couple really small tapped holes. And other than that, it was just uh, fun to go through this whole process and contribute something to a much bigger, cooler project. It was also kind of fun uh, to set up in camp, more specifically to run through it at the machine and get like a whole tool list set up, actually go through it. Now that I've, I've got the power draw bar, tool changes have become a lot easier and faster. And going through a slightly more complicated setup, or at least more operations in one uh, setup uh, is, is way easier and feels really smooth. Anyway, I just wanted to uh, show you that and uh, let's, let's just see some chips get made. So our part is pretty straightforward. We can do a number of these features in one setup. We can do the holes on the top face as well as the profile all the way around it. The hole in the center, the larger diameter of those two, is a pretty precise fit. It's a bearing fit, so we're going to have to take considerations for that. To get nice and precise machine dimensions on all the sides of this part, we're going to need to have to start with stock that's larger than the model. And that'll lead to some interesting setups, but it won't be difficult, so let's just dive in and see where we begin. I need you to see the bandsaw cutting off the stock from the bar on this aluminum, because the bandsaw is always competing for the shop vac for employee of the month in my shop. Anyway, here it is. If you haven't seen my channel or any of my other videos before, uh, just, just to clarify this, I have a small home-built or home-converted CNC milling machine. It's a Grizzly G0704. I converted it myself. I use Fusion 360 for CAD and CAM, and I just have a little shop in my backyard as a detached two-car garage. I'm cutting down this piece of aluminum uh, to make sort of a disposable pallet. It's just a one-off uh, from some scrap in the shop. I'm just smoothing out the top and I'm leaving a ledge on the back. What we're going to do for this first operation is the super glue and tape work holding method. And this is something that was popularized uh, by the guys at NYC CNC. It's really nice to give you access to all five sides of a six sided square part. So I've got my palette over there on the left and my work piece, the piece of stock I've got there on the right, both of them have some powder coating painters masking tape on them and you can scuff it up with some Scotch-Brite and this will basically create a nice surface for the best possible adhesion uh, for some good super glue. And then I give those surfaces a nice wipe down with an alcohol swab just to get any dust, any grease, any residue off of there so that the super glue can bind really well. In my experience, the brands of super glue, it all seems to be chemically the same. One is generally equivalent to the other, although you can get gels, you can get very thin, uh, consistency super glues, you can get different types, but generally speaking, it all works. The big considerations are pressure, and you, the parts need to be pressed together very well, and then temperature. Super glue does not like to set up when it's cold. In fact, it prefers slightly warmer environments. This tape will allow the removal of the part once all the machining is done to be very clean and, and swift. In this first operation, we're going to do as much as we can coming from this top down. So we're going to bore out this center hole using 2D adaptive and then a 2D profile to get us our two different diameters. And on the larger diameter, we're leaving a little bit of meat on the bone so we can come back and bore it. And then we're going to go around the entire part and profile it with an adaptive, then a profile. And then we're going to use a boring head to bore out the center hole, then a drill bit to drill the two smaller holes, and then some chamfer and engraving. 
So we've got a little list of tools here. Uh, this is a pretty cool setup for me. It's it's kind of cool having like a rack of every tool I'm going to use for the job and then a list of the numbers and then I can just plug them in as necessary. So with everything set up, let's let's make some cuts. For these first operations in this setup, I'm just using a three flute carbide quarter inch end mill. This is a generic one. I think I got it from Amazon, uh, but it, it cuts pretty well. It is coated and we're, we're using some pretty conservative feeds and speeds, but uh, at no detriment to the part, the accuracy or, you know, my time. I intentionally left about 10 thou off the radius of the larger diameter of the large hole in the center because that's supposed to be a bearing fit, and we're going to hit that with this boring head. Now, this is a pretty generic one I got off of eBay years and years ago, and I was actually able to find a mimic of a TTS Arbor that actually fits it, so it works in my milling machine, but basically it'll give us a nice, true, perfect hole that I was able to dial in and get spot on. This is so similar to like lathe theory in as much as like how much stock you have to pull off with a with a boring bar. And part of doing that was getting this boring head set up and I actually had to take several test cuts before running these parts and just get the boring head dialed in with the theoretical amount of radius to cut. And we got there, it took a few few different setups, a few adjustments, but it was really satisfying to be able to hit it in one shot. These two holes on the face of the part are actually going to be tapped 8 by 36 so I'm just running the tapping drill, which I believe is the number 29, uh, right through, and I'm running it all the way through the stock, and that's why we have this sacrificial pallet, is I can just run it right into the pallet and not really care. I have a keyless chuck, it's kind of a copy of an Albrecht style chuck. Uh, that I use for this odd size drill because I don't have an ER collet or a, just a tool holder that fits it, but it takes up so much Z clearance that it's really not ideal in my opinion. If you, if you can get away with it, don't use it. I'm taking the top face of the part down to dimension here in a simple facing operation. I could have used my home built fly cutter, but well, I've got this big carbide, so may as well use it, right?
Listen, we're all adults here, and that means we chamfer in the machine. It's not hard. We'll program a chamfer. We'll hit all of the features we just machined. I'm going to use a four fluid chamfer mill. Works better than a spotting drill. Yeah, that's it. That's all it is. We're just going to chamfer everything. The last operation of this setup is just some basic engraving. Uh, we were encouraged to embellish the parts with our name, logos, whatever. And so I put my name and the date on this part, some other stuff too. I'm using the four flute chamfer mill to engrave with. It actually works really well. It's got a really nice fine point. I've had some of the really fine ball end mills for engraving in the past. I've had a number of them and I've broken them all. I've just got bad luck with them. This one makes a really sharp single line engraving. And, uh, and it's stout. As for that bearing pocket dimension, well, they told me to hit 875, and gosh darn it, we got 875, at least within a few tenths. In this second setup, we're just going to flip the part over and machine off that little top hat, that muffin top, whatever you want to call it, the, just the, la the last part of the stock that we couldn't hit on the first setup. So it couldn't be easier. We're just literally going to flip it over in the machine, hold it in the vice jaws with parallels, and chop off that stock. We're going to use the tops of the parallels, which would be the bottom of the part and this orientation uh, that will be our work coordinate system set up and that way we ensure that we get the proper two dimension thickness from there I'm just letting big carbide do his thing uh, I probably could have taken more aggressive cuts on this but you'll see in a minute why it's pretty good not to be taking off a huge chunk when you've got overhangs in a top hat setup like this It's uh, taking this last pass that can be the most dangerous when we're actually hitting the dimension of the part and this overhang is just going to fly off like that. This was pretty much paper thin, so really wasn't an issue in this particular instance, but you can see how that could get really dangerous really fast. So be very careful when doing this kind of deck off procedure. I didn't get footage of the cut for some reason, but I set up a new setup where I retouched off on the now machined part to do an accurate chamfer on the backside. In this last setup, we're going to be drilling these two holes on each of the long sides. These are tap holes for a 2x56 thread. I've got a carbide drill, I believe it's a number 90 size, whichever the tap size is for 2x56, and it's got an eighth inch shank on it, so I can actually use it in a collet holder which gives me a little bit more rigidity and a little bit more Z-clearance. Kind of nice. I was a little worried about drilling these little tiny holes that my machine wouldn't be able to run the drill fast enough to be efficient and maybe cause problems, maybe break a bit or something. But no, didn't have any problems at all. It went rather nice. I just plain don't have the ability to tap or make threads in my machine without doing interpolated threads, which will be a next year thing. So we're tapping offline. I'm using my bench vise here, and I've leveled the part in my two machined jaws of this vise, and I've made a tapping block here, just a little guide that's got a perfectly matched hole that I can run my tap through. And we're starting with the 8 by 36 holes here. This this was a lot easier. I've, I've done so many number 8 tapped holes that, that this wasn't stress at all. Tapping these smaller holes, well, they're blind, and that adds uh, considerably to the already existing amount of pucker factor. 
So we had to go very slow tapping these. I used two different taps, a starter tap and then a bottoming tap. And then again, going slow and backing off constantly is the name of the game. I did use lubrication for all these threads, just some anchor lube. You can see it there smudged on my tap wrench. And luckily, carefully, slowly, I was able to get these threads all the way to the bottoms of these tiny little holes. Everything else being done, it was time to now finish up my part and give every surface a really nice, clean, polished look. And to do that, we really want to use some abrasive paper on an extremely flat surface. This here is my granite surface plate. It's been trued up and certified to within half of a ten thousandth of an inch in flatness across its whole thing. And I am absolutely not going to use that for sanding on. No, I've got this piece of random countertop that I got from a junk store. And it's great for doing exactly this. This Norton 320 grit abrasive against a really nice smooth backdrop. It sticks to it. It's adhesive backed. It's really perfect for parts like this. We're just trying to get a nice smooth even finish on all the flat surfaces. And with that, well and maybe a little bit of scotch bright pads as well, the parts are done and ready to ship out. Super super cool Now I know it's not a super sexy subject but something I've been working on in the last few months when sending things to clients and customers is my packaging game and I've been using scrap styrofoam with a home built wire cutter to make these blocks that'll fit in a box and I can use a bent piece of TIG wire this is stainless I heat it with a propane torch and it'll scoop out little form-fitting pockets in the styrofoam for the parts to sit. I've got a few of these different TIG wires that kind of you make them for each pocket. I top that styrofoam block with this cut out piece of cardboard. I use the laser engraver to cut it out and then engrave my logo on that. This whole setup fits perfectly inside of a USPS flat rate box. And with that, the parts are ready to be sent off to their new home. In fact, as of the time I'm recording this, I know that they've already received these parts, and the next step is going to see them being put into the Johnny Five project, alongside so many other awesome, cool creators, uh, some real big names in this project. And speaking of big names, uh, these are some of my favorites. They're the folks that support me on Patreon, and you can join them too by clicking the link. Either way, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.